Good evening, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us on another special episode of Speaking of Nebraska. Governor Pete Ricketts is back to answer your questions during this live town hall, along with Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Nebraska Commissioner of Education and a member of the NET Commission, Matt Bloomstead. Welcome as well. You can join the conversation tonight and we hope you do. Call us at 800-676-5446 or 402-472-1212 to ask your question. You can also email us at NET at uh, NET Nebraska, excuse me, news at netnebraska.org. Governor, welcome back. It's been a few months. Uh, a lot has happened, but it's great to have you back in the studio. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me back on. Absolutely. Before we dive into the questions uh, that have already been submitted to us uh, for tonight's dis discussion, let's get started a little bit with the status of COVID-19 in Nebraska. Although new cases of the virus started declining after a peak in early May, the virus is once again spreading at an increasing rate. This week, the state set a record for the seven-day average in daily new cases, and that number has continued to grow. So, uh, Governor Ricketts, you've emphasized from the very beginning that your priority is preserving hospital capacity in the state. Active COVID-19 hospitalizations are also on the rise. Today, 227 Nebraskans are in the hospital. Like new cases of the virus, active hospitalizations went down for several weeks before increasing again. So do you think moving the state into the final phase uh, of reopening, which you did last month, was the right choice, given that we've seen some increase in a couple of weeks since that happened? Yeah, absolutely. We are in a very different position today than we were, say, back in May, on a lot of different fronts. You know, just first of all, let's just take the treatments. I mean, with drugs like remdesivir and dexamethasone, we know how to treat COVID better. And just one of the examples of that is if you look at how many hospitalizations we have right now at the 227 you talked about, we have about half as many people on ventilators. So statewide, it's like 29 people on ventilators, which is a really small percentage compared to where it was in May. And that just demonstrates that our healthcare professionals have really gotten a lot better with regard to treating patients, uh, using oxygen, really trying to keep them off those ventilators, which once you put somebody on a ventilator, that means that they're gonna, probably gonna stay there for a while. We also have much more robust testing going on right now. So for example, if you look at the last few days of test reports back, you'll see that uh, you know, the test reports you know, for today were like over 9,000. Yesterday was over 6,000. Day before that was over 7,000. If you go back and look at May, the numbers were much, much smaller. So we're doing a lot more testing, which obviously helps us find more cases so we can then ask those people to isolate and stay out of the rest of the community. We also have much more robust contact tracing to be able to do that. Uh, we're staffing up our folks to have a thousand different folks, you know, that thousand, we're really at that level now, really there where we have those folks. We're not even using them all because we just don't have that kind of demand yet. But the public health departments have also hired up, so we've got robust contact tracing. We've got lots of levels of, you know, high levels of PPE. About the only thing we don't really have big supplies of is the N95 masks, which is what the healthcare professionals prefer to use. But we've got lots of the CAN95 masks that, you know, um, that has been approved by the um, FDA and the CDC and so forth. We've got uh, our accommodation program, for example, for teachers to be able to allow them to go someplace and be able to quarantine or keep away from people um, so they don't have to risk either bringing the virus home or getting it home and so forth. So just a lot of different resources that we have that we didn't have in May. So we're continuing to monitor the situation. We continue, Dr. Antone, our chief medical officer is on the phone. Um, you know, weekly, if not daily, with uh, the CMOs and CEOs of these hospital systems. We're working with those hospital systems with regard to additional plans for how we can make sure we can handle the in increased traffic. And the other thing I just wrap up with is say is, if you look at the overall percentage of COVID cases in the hospital, it's still very small. So for example, if you look at Omaha area, you're talking about less than 5% of the hospital beds are using, being used by COVID patients a little over 10% of the ICU beds and about three and a half percent of the ventilators. Uh, if you look at Lincoln, for example, the numbers are pretty similar. It's, it's actually more as a percentage of hospital beds. It's about 16, almost 17% of the hospital beds in Lincoln. It's, you know, it's 60 cases. 
Uh, but if you look at the ICU beds, again, it's about 11.7%. If you look at the um, ventilators being used, it's like 4%. So again, it, when we see some of the hospitalization utilization, it's not just COVID patients doing it. In fact, the vast majority is people who are not COVID patients. When you look at that bed capacity, though, it has been fairly stable between 25 and 35 percent. But you mentioned Omaha. You mentioned some of those specific areas. Omaha, uh, 14 percent of beds currently available. Should some of those areas with the lower hospital capacity, like Douglas County, maybe reinstate stricter regulations? So it's certainly one of the things we're looking at. And this is one of the things we talked to those hospital CEOs and CMOs about. And obviously, we're going to keep all of our options on the table. But I think it's also important to remember that under normal conditions, you know, they'll run at 90% capacity, right? So that's a normal hospital operating. And it wouldn't be unusual, again, in normal times for hospitals because maybe a, an ER doc was not available to divert people from one hospital to another hospital. So there's these, you know, they've got all sorts of protocols in place to do that already from normal operations. So we certainly want to keep that in mind. We want to make sure that they can handle and accommodate any new people coming in. And we've done that very successfully throughout this pandemic to be able to offer that hospital bed, that ICU bed, that ventilator to anybody who needs it when they need it. And that's why Dr. Antone is on the phone with these folks every day talking through to make sure that they're comfortable with regard to where they are with regard to their hospital census and looking to see if we need to make any changes and what sorts of other things the state could do to be able to help facilitate, for example, staffing, to be able to help them out and, and make sure that they've got the appropriate staffing. Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, welcome tonight. Um, Thank you. So far, 400 uh, uh, 93 Nebraskans have died of COVID-19. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said that this week that number will likely climb to around 561 deaths by October 24th. And the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation estimates universal masking in Nebraska could save up to 480 lives by December 1st. So how much emphasis do you put on wearing a mask and how well do you think Nebraskans are doing when it comes to wearing masks? So I have my mask with me uh, all the time and uh, I wear it uh, because I know the science shows that it not only protects me but it protects others as well and we try very hard to set the right example for folks. I think from a scientific perspective there is no question that masking reduces the spread of not just coronavirus but the flu or, and anything and everything else that's spread through respiratory droplets. Uh, I think that's a given. My experience, particularly, you know, since we've reopened the university and walking through campus, res halls, dining facilities, etc., is that the overwhelming majority, I mean, it's a rare exception for me to see somebody who is not wearing a mask. Now, we're all more than six feet apart tonight, and I feel comfortable uh, being here with you. Otherwise, I would be uh, wearing my mask tonight. But uh, I think that Nebraskans generally are, are doing a pretty darn good job of it. Now, you know, it, we all know that there are exceptions to that. We've seen everything from weddings to other group gatherings where there was some super spreader individual that uh, caused a good deal of misery in that community and one sort of spread to another. And when that happens in one of our rural communities, it has an impact, right? It fills hospital beds, causes transfers, and, and concerns the community. I think overall the state is doing pretty darn well. Could we do better? You betcha. Uh, and that's why, you know, I think we all need to lead by example. One of the questions we got came the, from the community of Blair, and this mm -hmm. person said, why aren't we recognizing that only the chronically ill and elderly citizens need to be wearing a mask and restricting their time in stores, churches, and around others? I'm guessing you would say that's not true. Well, I think the elderly and more vulnerable absolutely need to wear a mask and restrict their time with others. But if we want to be responsible and not carry infection from the community to them, then we do also. And I think that's the message. You know, there's this tremendous amount of confusion as to where the young people, you know, can K-12 schools, and I know we're going to unpack that in a minute, uh, and, and in the university level, really get sick from COVID. And with the observation is, uh, although some of them get really sick and hospitalized and tragically will actually die from it, the overwhelming majority will have minimal symptoms or no symptoms at all. And we've seen that in the university extensively. But we also know that they do carry very high virus loads when they're sick and they're capable of transmitting it very rapidly to their parents and grandparents who are going to be more vulnerable. And, you know, that is the concern about all of this. 
Commissioner Matt Bloomstead, want to bring you in on the conversation as well. Uh, each school district in the state developed its own plan to return to school this fall following guidelines from the State Department of Education and federal, state, and local health officials. So data from your office shows a 72% increase in the number of families homeschooling this year. And many districts are offering full uh, virtual options for students. So do you know how many Nebraska youth are learning at home this year versus how many are learning uh, in the classroom, and what do we know about the effectiveness of virtual versus in-person education? Yeah, as far as the numbers right now, and, and we're actually soon to see Omaha Public Schools re-enter into their, the, the second quarter that you'll see um, their students back into a, a in-person learning experience. We have schools like Lincoln and Omaha that have uh, uh, laid out plans that we kind of 50% of their students because they're worried about how the social distancing might work in their, their particular schools. But when we look across the state, and I can only have a kind of an estimate, but about 90% of our students are receiving some type of in-person experience. And for the vast majority of our schools outside of the metro area, they're really in school. But schools, certain schools have offered uh, some type of remote option. It's been a, I, I think parents really wanted that, especially with the uncertainties when we when we entered into the summertime and folks weren't sure how that would work. Um, I think as it's gone on, folks have become more comfortable in that in-person setting. They've, they've seen that schools are doing a really good job of understanding how to wear masks how to keep the students safe and we've not really seen very much transmission at all within school settings and so we're learning just like we like we've tried to do through this whole process um, the other part of learning though is remote learning and that's been a challenge we've had teachers I have a teacher advisory group uh, and it's been really hard for teachers to teach in both settings and so what I've heard from uh, these teachers that have been advising me we could really use some more additional time uh, to improve the re remote learning opportunities to put us in a better position Position to be successful and so actually this week I, I, I've announced and will be announcing kind of a, allowing some flexibility so teachers can have some prep time across the state and, and superintendents have been asking for that particular time too to really double down on our efforts to re improve that remote learning overall and and I think that's good we also have learned that engaging with parents is a little bit different when you're in a remote environment and I've heard from teachers and you know, somewhat some funny stories that the parent will come in and talk to their their child and say what are you learning and the child waves them away right so so I mean it's it's been a, it's been an interesting learning experience but we'll continue to do that continue to give people time to improve that practice and and we're looking at it too what are other things could we scale up uh, digital resources that we'd like to be able to do the governor's been uh, very helpful in thinking about how we make sure that we have the infrastructure structure in place to do remote learning as necessary and we'll continue to do that work. Do you think though there's going to be a gap between the, the learning edge from those who are in person versus those who are remote and, and as far as measuring that gap Katie from Lincoln asks what will state testing look like considering the diverse schooling models within Nebraska schools this year? Yeah, we, we've done a few things, and I do think there could be a gap. It's, it's, we can't expect that teachers are gonna be able to turn that corner right away, have the level of engagement that you might have in, a, in an in-classroom experience. But we've actually experienced some, some students that are actually doing better seeing that kind of uh, environment be helpful for them. We, even students, for example, with autism that, that might have some other struggles have actually done well in some of those environments. So we're learning. It's not, it's not perfect for everyone necessarily. Um, as we have that gap, and we're, we're trying to uh, set up a pretty unique structure in Nebraska to have uh, what we do through year assessment instead of just one summative assessment. And we're actually taking this opportunity. I've, I've asked schools to be innovative, and we're being innovative, thinking about that assessment that we have for grades three through eight shaping that so we can do a little bit more uh, kind of uh, understanding of what the impacts are in the current environment and hopefully be able to learn from that and improve. Well, we're going to continue to talk about education, but let's switch gears a little bit, Governor. Um, Nebraska. Well, we no, we keep talking about education. No, no, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the job. spot here. Nebraska's <laughs> unemployment rate in August was 4%, lowest in the nation. But since the pandemic began last spring, we've had sustained higher levels of unemployment than normal throughout the summer. About 134,000 Nebraskans have been paid unemployment benefits during the pandemic. So what is the impact of so many Nebraskans out of work for six months or more? What's that going to have on the state's economy long term? Well, certainly that's one of the reasons that we want to get people back to work as quickly as possible. Uh, again, obviously we want to do it so they can stay healthy while they're doing it. So we're, you know, we want companies to use their good judgment with regard to their plans, make sure they allow for people to work remotely where it's appropriate and so forth. Uh, and we do, I think we have struck that balance here in the state that has led us to the lowest unemployment rate. 
Some of the programs we already have in place, though, through, for example, the Department of Labor, is we have job coaches for all the folks in the state. You don't even have to be unemployed to be able to get access to it. And they can help you with all sorts of things, such as uh, you know, putting together a resume, how do you look for that next best job, uh, you know, tips on where to look for that next best job. And so with those job coaches that we have and those resources, we can really help people who maybe have been employed, unemployed for a while and they're starting to get a little rusty on how to look for a job, we can help them that way. And then one of the other things we're doing with the CARES Act money is we set aside $16 million for our community colleges to help people who maybe want to upgrade their job skills, uh, maybe get a new certificate to be able to get that better job so that they can you know, take that step, go back to school, and go look for that next best job and have the skills to be able to do it. So we've got some resources out there for people who maybe have been unemployed and want to take advantage of those. And that's, and we will continue to look for innovative ways to be able to do that and leverage the resources we have at the state or, you know, to, to be able to help folks get that next best job. And so when it comes to businesses, you've lifted nearly all of the restrictions on the businesses between, uh, but between two and 3,000 new Nebraskans have filed jobless claims each week uh, for the past two months. Many of those people are struggling, having problems paying the rent or buying food, which leads us to the questions we received about the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Brian and Lincoln asks, if you know uh, that Nebraskans are suffering from hunger due to COVID-19, why won't you accept the SNAP benefits that all 49 other states have accepted? Claire in Omaha, Sarah in Bellevue asked pretty much the same question. So what's the downside to accepting this temporary expansion of the federal program since it wouldn't cost the state money? Well, so what we're doing, it, it, so remember, it, that money is still our money, right? That money doesn't come from nowhere. That has to come from people across the United States who are earning it, or we have to go out and borrow from places like China, right? That money isn't free, right? So that still has, those are still resources that has to be taken from the people of America to pay those. And if you look at Nebraska, again, being the least economically impacted state in the country, having the lowest unemployment rate in the country, and if you actually look at the SNAP data, it shows that we are at a level of SNAP uh, recipients where we were pre-pandemic. So if you go back and look at, say, February, we had about 70,000 families that were on that SNAP program and about 153,000, well, it was actually 151,000 people. Uh, if you go look at the peak, when we hit in May, we had about 70,000 uh, families and about 78,000 families and about 170,000 people. And then if you look at where we were in August, we, that number was back down to about 71,000 families and about 151,000 people. And in fact, that's a lower number than where we were in, in September of 19. So if you actually look at August 20 to September of 19, we actually have fewer people on SNAP right now than we did then. And that really gives you an indication that people are getting back to work. And the thing about the emergency SNAP benefits that they're referring to is that's a maximum amount. That was a, a temporary emergency measure. About 40% of the families on SNAP already get the, the maximum amount because of income. It's based on income. So if you're one of those families that based on your income would still do, get that maximum benefit, you're still going to get that maximum benefit. Okay, and then there's other programs which we are still accepting, like the emergency EBT program, the additional stuff for the WIC program, you know, women, infants, and children. Uh, we took the uh, additional money from the unemployment insurance that paid out through August and September. So there were other programs that people do have access to, and the idea again is that you want to kind of step people down off of those maximum benefits as we return to more normal, so that you don't have that cliff effect. So that's really kind of the strategy behind what we'd be doing is really kind of stepping this down getting people back to normal, getting people back to work. And again, the data really shows, if you look at how many people are on SNAP, that we're actually back to a, a normal level of SNAP recipients. Dr. Gold, I'm gonna give you this question. Hank from McCool Junction calls in tonight, and he says, according to the CDC website, only 6% of COVID deaths are due only to COVID, with the other 94% having some sort of underlying condition, such as cancer, diabetes. Why don't medical experts use the 6% figure when referring to total deaths from COVID? Sure. So, uh, believe it or not, uh, there's a lot of debate that goes on as to how to classify somebody as having actually died from COVID or with COVID. And that's really the question. So, if an otherwise asymptomatic person happens to have a diagnosis of COVID that they don't know about and they tragically get into a motor vehicle accident and, and pass away, uh, that gets into exactly that kind of consideration. But to be specific to, to your question, 
Uh, there are lots of people with heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, who are in the process of being treated for their disease, who have a pretty decent prognosis. That is to say, they're not pre-morbid. They're, they're not hospitalized. They're not in hospice care or long-term care. Uh, they lead, lead a full life. And then they get COVID, and then all of a sudden they're either hospitalized or placed on a ventilator, as the governor was talking about, and, uh, and they tragically pass away. And so those, those uh, considerations add up to a diagnosis of dying uh, from COVID, and, uh, because that really changed their prognosis. Now, that's in the ideal world. Unfortunately, with over 200,000 deaths in the United States, every state, every hospital, the coding that goes on with the local public health districts, I believe creates a whole lot of uncertainty. Uh, some would say we're markedly under-classifying deaths uh, due to COVID. Some would say that we're markedly over-classifying deaths due to COVID, as this questioner uh, points out. To me, the, the most important thing is the consistency, because if we're using the number of deaths per million per week in the United States, in our communities, in the state of Nebraska, as a metric, we like to compare week to week, month to month, you know, and see whether we're making progress or not making progress. We'd like to know whether we're seeing a change in age demographics, gender, race, or ethnicity. We'd like to see the balance between rural and urban death, as well as, of course, new cases and test positivity. And so if we have a consistent way of classifying the death, that gives us another statistical tool to empower us to better, uh, to reduce the amount of death, reduce the amount of hospitalization uh, from COVID. All right. Commissioner Bloomstead, our next question is for you. It's a video question submitted by Jenny in Hastings. Hi, my name's Jenny, and I'm from Hastings, Nebraska. My question tonight is why the State Department of Education has not taken a bigger role in developing protocols for the uh, area schools, especially when it comes to e-learning. Now, Hastings Public Schools has done a phenomenal job, but I know there are other school districts in this state that have taken even punitive measures towards their, their families that have chosen e-learning as their delivery method for education for their children. Thank you. Commissioner Bloomstead. Yeah, and so, I mean, first of all, we actually uh, put out uh, guidance starting clear back in April. We just started that in, and in May, something we called Launch Nebraska or LaunchNE.com. And so folks can see the types of guidance that the department has put out. Um, and we actually did trainings right out of the bat, knowing that there would be a need to move to a remote learning environments and, and put out different resources. But we also tried to strike a balance on what the local school's abilities were, um, really having them build their own uh, particular plans I don't know exactly what, what the punitive things. I'd be glad to hear more if somebody emailed me on that particular front. But we really tried to work with schools. We'll be actually offering additional guidance and kind of reframing some of that, like the remote learning, ensuring that students are having good experiences. We've heard concerns around uh, students with special needs and making sure that their IEPs are being met. And we continue to offer that guidance all the time to our schools. And so if there are folks that have some type of challenge, they, they're certainly welcome to email me. We I take those those emails quite often and we take that very seriously and try to work with folks on those solutions but I would say overall there are very good examples as you mentioned uh, Hastings and we have many others many other schools that are doing really good things and we'll, we'll see people learn and improve and that's that's our hope so it's all it is also hope, helpful to know uh, places that may be struggling we ask them to reach out to us and we can provide that additional assistance another interesting question came in from Lincoln as well talking about uh, what habits or routines are schools currently doing Doing due to COVID that you think they'll continue doing after COVID? Yeah, I, I actually think some of the habits and things and some of the innovations that I want to talk about, we actually have to move a bit more towards personalized learning. I've believed that for a long time. We've worked on digital resources and, and uh, moving down that particular path. But we, we see schools that are, even if they're struggling right now, that means they're still learning and giving us a chance to really shape that. I think there's some things that we can scale up as a state. I really do think that digital resources overall are the types of things that we can scale up. We're, we're using data, and like I mentioned, even with assessment, We'll be doing things different as a result of the pandemic. And we actually can take those steps forward in this moment in time where others maybe would say, well, we don't want that change. And folks are actually looking for that type of innovation and change right now. Governor, we have a question called into us from Connie. When are we going to get into uh, long-term facilities to see our loved ones? Uh, 7th of October will be seven months since I've seen my spouse. 
Say what you want about window visits and FaceTime, it's not the same. It feels like I'm paying to have my spouse in prison when he has no rights and families have no rights either. Why do facilities follow different CMS guidelines and different local indicators? So, uh, Connie, first of all, I totally understand where you're coming from because I, I get it. Families want to see their loved ones and the loved ones want to have families visit. The thing about long-term care facilities is that when you've got that conjugate living, you know, people living together like that, and people who are older with those potentially underlying health care conditions, that's going to be most vulnerable. So, for example, you can look at states like New Jersey where they had over 6,600 people die in their long-term care facilities. And uh, here in Nebraska, you know, tragically, we've had about 199 people die. And, of course, all those families grieve the loss of a loved one. And we're trying to prevent, you know, from that number of, of ours from growing like it happened when it impacted New Jersey because, you know, they were early on and, again, had less ability to cope with it. So we have put protocols in place to allow long-term care facilities to allow visitors. Uh, you know, they have to be in phase three of what we're, our guidelines that we put out, and that will allow them to have, you know, facilities to allow visitors to come in. Now, if they have a resident or a staff member test positive, they've got to go back to square one and start over again with regard to allowing visitors in. But we do allow that, that ability. So, it, you know, I would suggest to Connie maybe reach out to the management of your specific facility and find out where they are because I know that that is possible for people to go visit. But, again, they've got to be able to make sure that they're doing the proper testing and they haven't had anybody test positive and so forth to be able to allow those visits. And, again, we just want to be super careful with this population because we know they're, they're so vulnerable and that, it, you know, it can really be devastating if the virus gets loose in one of those facilities. So we are taking extra precautions. And we know it's tough on the families. Trust me, we hear about this um, every day. And we're just doing the best we can. I know those facilities are doing the best they can to try and really balance off not just preventing the spread of the virus, but all the other sort of health needs that go along with the residents. And in fact, this is one of the things that, you know, back in July, we asked all the long-term care facilities to give us their plan for not only how they're gonna manage COVID, but how they're gonna manage mental health and all the other things that go along with the well-being of the residents. And Dr. Gold, I want to follow up with you on this sure. as well, because uh, you, the population of these long-term facilities, just a small part of the overall U.S. population, but they're accounting for over 40 percent of the deaths from COVID. Sure. So, and UNMC has been very involved in working with nursing homes across the state. What is your advice in trying to balance the safety issues, but also we know about the long-term effects of isolation as well. So how do you balance that? There is no question. And the uh, Med Center is really proud to not only do site visits to long-term care facilities, but to food processing plants. You know, as uh, Commissioner Bloomstead said, where the med centers reached out to countless school districts uh, across the state that have asked for guidance. Uh, it's, you know, our advice is to take a balanced approach as best as possible. We've learned uh, from our geriatric psychiatrists, the mental health experts that deal with individuals in these facilities, that having a structured day with activity making sure we use electronic technology as best as possible. And one of the things that I've seen that to be really effective is sometimes you can visit outdoors. And because we are in the fresh air and uh, it's easier to prevent the spread of the virus. And so that's a preliminary step that's being used widely across the country. And it seems to be safe. And so I, I, you know, I see this as a set of staged steps uh, moving forward. But there's no question that the balance of mental health, and that's true in the K-12 schools as much as it is, frankly, in our long-term care facilities and in our nursing homes. It's certainly true in the healthcare business that we're in. I mean, we have a lot of burnt out people that are working hard, long hours, and this has been going on for more than half a year now. And so we, we've got to stay focused on the long-term goals here. We've obviously got to get a safe and effective vaccine uh, available and then get it deployed and then get our lives back to normal. Really? And I've got to jump in on that a little bit too because one of the other things that has been, I think, really helpful for us here in Nebraska is that four years ago, the state got a grant from CDC and we worked with UNMC to create uh, the ICAP program, the Infection Control and Assessment, uh, Assessment and Promotion Program. Basically, long before this pandemic, to have folks from the UNMC put together a program to teach long-term care facilities how to control the spread of infections. And I think that's one of the things that's really been helpful here. And of course, UNMC continues to do that, as Dr. Gold was talking about, with on-site visits to do more training, webinars, um, all that sort of thing has been really helpful, I think, for us to be able to help make sure the staffs are appropriately trained to be able to 
to limit the spread of the infections in those facilities. Yeah, and guides. You know, we, we've issued uh, guidebooks for everything from early childhood to K-12 to universities to meat processing, uh, the judicial system, right. on and on. And so it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure and a real honor uh, to be able to help. And that has translated uh, into some of the lowest mortality rates, frankly, in, in the country uh, here in Nebraska. And we're very proud of that. We want to remind everybody you're watching a special episode of Speaking of Nebraska with Governor Pete Ricketts and Dr. Jeffrey Gold of UNMC and Nebraska Commissioner of Education Matt Bloomstead. Give us a call. The number is 800-676-5446 or you can also call 402-472-1212 with your question. You can also send us an email, news at netnebraska.org. And you can send your questions on social media as well. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. Well, more than 40, uh, 460,000 people in Nebraska have tested, uh, have been tested, I should say, many through the state's uh, Test Nebraska initiative. The $27 million contract with several private companies was the state's effort to quickly scale up COVID-19 test testing. Dana in Seward sent us a question about Test Nebraska. Governor Ricketts, I am Dana from Seward. You tout Test Nebraska as the best way to flatten the curve, slow the spread, and get test results. My son has been waiting for over a week now for his results, and they haven't even been processed. They're still sitting in the lab. He's missed AP classes. He's missed two cross-country meets. He's a junior in high school, and we're still waiting for Test Nebraska to do its job. This is a failed public-private partnership where the public has thrown money, that's us, we're the public, we pay the bills, to a private organization that is not doing its job. Governor Ricketts, how will you fix this and let us know that this is actually in the best interest of our state and its residents? Thank you. And Governor, we should point out that the average turnaround time for Test Nebraska results over the past two weeks is about three and a half days. Is that good enough? Well, certainly we want it to be faster, and Dana's got a great point. It's, I, we understand how frustrating it is when you're waiting for those test results back that we really want to turn around in 72 hours or less, and uh, he's waiting for over a week, so I totally understand his frustration. And we have been working to be able to reduce that turnaround time. In fact, yesterday I think we had a turnaround time less than 24 hours. And what we've been doing is we've been adding on additional staff, we've been uh, buying additional equipment, we've actually been going out uh, and starting to hire staff over and above what we need to run the lab 24 hours in case we have somebody come down sick, they can't make it in for whatever reason so that we never run short of those staffing to be able to make sure we can keep processing it through. There's other things we know that we can do better. For example, we do a lot of the testing for long-term care facilities when they do come up with a test positive. And so we may get a, a big, you know, slug of tests coming all at once, which can then slow down, potentially slow down the lab. So we're working to try and figure out better processes for that as well, because Dana is absolutely right. It shouldn't take a week to be able to get those results back. We want to turn them around within that three day time frame. In fact, we want to turn around faster than that. And if you look at the overall um, time frame for Test Nebraska from the, the start of it, the turnaround time is about a little over two and a half days to be able to get that done. So. We absolutely hear what Dan is saying. We are working to get that, that turned around so that we can do a better job of getting it turned around. But I would also point out that if it wasn't for Test Nebraska, we'd be doing half the number of tests we're doing today. So Test Nebraska has allowed us to really double the amount of testing that we're doing today and get to the point where we're doing you know, significantly more than the minimum amount of testing that the folks at our public health officials and UNMC told us we needed to be doing. You know, back when this pandemic started, they say minimally you need to be about 3,000 tests per day. And so we are now regularly exceeding that number of tests per day, even just with Test Nebraska. And then the final point I'll make is other labs have had the same sort of issues, right? So when you're talking about the commercial labs, we had some commercial labs who had uh, tests that were taking 18 days to get turned around. And that is clearly, at that point, the test is useless. So, uh, you know, we reached out to those labs to ask them to improve their performance, and they have. Uh, we just had the issue with uh, UNMC and NPHL, our Nebraska Public Health Lab this week. It wasn't test related, it was technology related. But those kind of things are going to happen and we just got to work our way through this. Again, this is new for everybody. So when we find a problem, we got to figure out what do we do to fix the problem and mitigate it so that it doesn't become that kind of risk in the future. 
Speaking of testing, President Trump announced this week the federal government is going to distribute millions of rapid coronavirus tests to states this week. He wants the governors to use them to reopen K-12 through schools completely. Uh, do you know how many tests Nebraska is going to get? And as the governor, how are you going to use those tests? Are they going to go to schools? Yeah, so we're looking at that right now. We expect that we'll get about 580,000 of those tests before the end of the year. And to put that in perspective, if you look at how many tests, so you mentioned the 400 and some thousand Nebraskans have been tested. If you look at the overall tests we've done, it's more like 625, 630,000 tests we've done. So if you put that in perspective of over six months, we've done over 600,000 tests, and now we're going to get almost another 600,000 tests in the next three months. You see we're going to have a lot more testing capacity because of these Abbott by Next Now tests that we're going to get. Um, one of the things we've got to remember is they're not as accurate. So they're not going to have the same accuracy as the polymerase, polymerase chain reaction machines that we're doing right now, say, through Test Nebraska. Those are kind of the gold standard of how you do this coronavirus testing. But they are going to have a, a use for us. And we are thinking right now, given the limitations of the test from the standpoint of they're not quite as accurate, but they're a lot faster. You can get the results back in 15 minutes. So how do we best leverage that to be able to make sure that we're you know, using it in a way that is going to allow us to catch uh, where there may be spreads of the virus and so forth. So we're thinking about those um, exact scenarios right now, and I would say just stay tuned because we we're not ready to announce how we're going to deploy them yet. But we are excited about the opportunity to be able to leverage those to be able to, again, do more around trying to catch the virus and nip those uh, you know, spreading events in the bud so they don't get out of control. So not committing to sending them to schools just yet. It's one of, it's one of the options we're looking at right now to try and figure out what's going to be the best option. Okay. Dr. Gold, talk about the accuracy that the governor touched on of these rapid tests, because we're hearing about it from these tests from the president. We're also hearing about it when it comes to Big Ten football and sure. the football teams mm. using those. Are they accurate? Are they the answer? So there are different types of point-of-care tests. So the polymerase chain reaction or the PCR test that uh, the governor just related to is, is the standard. It's got high 90 percent specificity and sensitivity. It is the basic test that we use. That's the nasal swab that everybody sees pictures of. But we've probably read about both saliva tests and what we can now call these antigen tests. The saliva tests, which have been popularized by the NBA and are quite successful there, are screening tests. They were built in collaboration with Yale University initially. And I'm proud to say that the Med Center is also working on a new variety of that that hopefully will roll out in the not so distant future as well because it's a lot easier to collect saliva. But that's also a polymerase chain reaction test, high volume throughput done in a laboratory. It's not really a point of care test. The antigen tests, however, they are very different. Uh, they are not polymerase chain reaction tests and they are very much like an early home pregnancy test or a strep dex or, or something along those lines. Uh, where you'll do a little bit of a nasal swab, you'll drop it in some fluid, and then you'll put it on a card, and then it'll either turn red, yeah, you've uh, got uh, antigens against the virus, or, or you don't. So from a specificity point of view, that is to say, is it the accurate uh, COVID-19 virus causing agent, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, it's pretty accurate. But from a sensitivity perspective, it's going to miss about oh, depending on the test, anywhere between 15 and 25 percent of the patients who actually carry some levels of virus. But the question is, is that for individuals that are carrying really low levels of virus, are they actually contagious? I mean, it may be you need a certain level in order to really spread the virus to other people. And so I think, as the governor said, the two tests are not interchangeable, the PCR uh, and the rapid point-of-care antigen test. So I see the antigen test more like a screening test, high volume, high throughput, you know, think athletics, uh, think weddings, think, uh, you know, church ceremonies and things along those lines, whereas anybody that tests positive would have to be validated uh, with a PCR test just to be very, very sure that one, it's SARS-CoV-2, and secondly, uh, that you can make the diagnosis. But for rapid screening, uh, it's going to be very, very hard uh, to use traditional PCR tests. And frankly, the volume uh, would become uh, almost undoable uh, across the country. So I see this as a blend of the two. 
And of course, the antigen tests cost a fraction of what the PCR tests cost. And, you know, uh, cost efficiency is going to be really important if we're going to get this out to the point that people are self-testing in schools and churches and other places. Commissioner Bloomstead, I want to go back to a topic that you already touched on earlier in the program, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about it. We've received questions from several teachers concerned about the workload that the school, now that the school is back in session. Here's a video question from Joanne. My name is Joanne Catlett. I am from Lincoln, Nebraska. Here is my question. Teachers need accreditation hours to be modified during this pandemic. Teachers need time to plan, grade, prep, for all learners in, in and out of the classroom. Two jobs wrapped into one. Will you be able to help support the mental health of teachers by allowing them to be prepared to provide the best education they can for four days of the week and give them one day to do the necessary work to be prepared to provide the best education the next four days of school? Teachers cannot provide the best education without time to prepare. We are drowning. Our health will begin to deteriorate before long. So we've got several questions. Uh, Kathy in Omaha, Elizabeth and Lincoln both asked about the same question. I think there's a couple of questions here. One's about the possibility of a four-day work, uh, a four-day week for in-person learning. And the other one is just about the overall stress that teachers are under and, and, and how are we going to help them? Yeah, and as I mentioned before, as I've talked to the teachers in this advisor group that I've had, I could see the stress. It was like early on and I could tell that that was really a challenge. And I, I have a superintendent's advisory group as well that includes Lincoln Public Schools and, and schools from all over the state. And we've had that dialogue with them going, how can we uh, help balance the workload that teachers are experiencing? And so we've not talked about uh, one day a week or going to a four day uh, school week, but actually what I've been proposing is actually a reduction in the number of instructional hours that have to be offered because we're recognizing that stress. I'd prefer high quality instruction that's that, that teachers aren't overwhelmed, that students aren't overwhelmed, that we can balance those things out. So really, as we enter the second quarter, and it's amazing, we're in, you know, completing a first quarter of school. As we enter that second quarter, I wanna see uh, more flexibility for teachers to be able to balance that workload. I also, I think schools will get better at remote learning. We have some schools that actually have dedicated uh, remote learning teachers, so they're not having to do both at the same time. And I, I think finding some ways to do that will be important. I know schools have actually really wanted to get their students in in school because that helps to balance some of that as well um, I know in many places where they've where they're trying to do both at the same time that's a real challenge for teachers and actually here's the stress at least what I've heard from teachers their stress is yes certainly about them but also about their concern of reaching each one of those uh, each one of those learners and so I think again um, finding time to do that that's certainly one thing and I'll be issuing commissioners guidance that actually allows schools to use instructional hours differently to provide some of that some of that time We'll be offering uh, flexibilities and continue to do that and then continue to provide uh, guidance on that remote learning to help balance those teachers' uh, burdens that they may have in the classroom. And if you reduce the instruction hours, does that mean the schools are going to have to stay open longer? No, actually what it means that when you look at the whole year, oddly enough, Nebraska has a, a, a law on the books that actually goes back to 1918 that allows for flexibility around pandemics of all things and epidemics. And so we've been uh, using that for flexibility, talking to our schools. We want them in school. We want them in school as much as possible, but we know that there's going to be these types of disruptions. And I think it's, it's really important that we do the best that we can in these moments in time. And part of that's, you know, taking a little bit of time to, to regroup understand what's going to work best and move us forward as a, as a state, but also at an individual school level. And it, it bothers me that teachers are so stressed, and so I want to kind of keep that message out there. We're looking for a lot of different ways, and I know school leaders and school boards across the state are doing the same. Got a question from uh, Ann in Lincoln. Um, she's upset about the 3-2 the plan in Lincoln with the high school kids uh, going back to overcrowded schools. She said as Lincoln's COVID numbers are rising, the state's COVID numbers uh, are rising as well. Lincoln's ICUs are closer to getting to capacity. So she asked Governor Ricketts, are you putting pressure on the districts to open up no matter what or threatening to pull any kind of funding or resources? No, we have, as we've talked about, we've really let the schools determine how they want to go about doing the education program. Uh, you know, Mr. Bloomstead actually doesn't report to me, he reports to his own elected state board of education. And 
so we haven't done anything with regard to um, you know putting pressure on schools to reopen and frankly we've had a great working relationship with regard to how we go about approaching this we've you know been have a lot of communication about what the best thing is and, and frankly the fact of the matter is you know we're all learning as you mentioned commissioner we're all learning a way through this at the same time so there is not going to be one right answer for every school district uh, you know OPS is just now starting to make the preparation to have kids in the classroom I know dr. Logan is doing the best job she can she knows <laughs> that kids are going to look learn best in the classroom but she's also got to make sure she's balancing all that off as well so I think every school district has got to make that decision and I know that uh, the school districts have created those individualized plans that that make sense for their particular school district and, and can I add just sure. you know quickly and I, I really have appreciated the working relationship that we had there's not been pressure it's actually been about the local schools figuring this out Here, here's the reality no one had experienced this before we didn't know how safe these environments could be our data is actually starting to show that with all the other proper pre precautions masks social distancing thoughtfulness about how students move within classrooms how they're how they're positioned things that we're doing in cafeterias and lunchrooms some of that based on uh, uh, help from UNMC and, and and providing guidance on those fronts has come together into a pretty workable solution and so as schools do come back to a, a fuller or more full capacity uh, we actually have a pretty good grasp of what protocols are necessary to keep Keep them safe and we keep watching that data too so if we see something that's not working we'll make changes but but right now we're seeing really good success across the state you know Doc, Dennis this, this I was is another say, really you've, you've put out a report point. on this so so tell us a little bit about your feelings on yeah it. so what I just want to underscore what the commissioner said is that even when we see cases uh, in school-aged children the overwhelming majority of the transition uh, when you do contact tracing is from the community. It is not spread in the classrooms, in the university level, it's not spread in the teaching labs, it's not spread in the residence halls or the dorms. It is from community spread. And so the message that we try to send to the kids is that it's not just when you're on campus or in school that you have to be safe, but it's when you're home, it's when you're having some social gatherings on the weekends, etc. And we continue to study this. And I would also add, you know, the, one of the metrics we look at very carefully is the number of new cases per day per million population. It's just a way of looking across the country in a sort of standardized way. There are parts in Nebraska, so the U.S. average uh, as of this morning is about 150, 155 cases per million per day. We have parts in Nebraska that are 35 cases per million per day. We have parts in Nebraska that are 300 cases per million per day. And so the decisions as to the safety of the schools, you know, going to church, uh, uh, social events, et cetera, have to be weighed against what's going on in the local community. And that's critically important. And that's why giving the school systems and the local districts the capability to adjust real time as to what they need to do, I think is a very, you want to give them the tools, but you want to give them the flexibility uh, to do it their way as well. Dr. Gold Al from Lincoln uh, says now that hospitalizations are up sharply, is it time to put a hold on elective surgeries again? Uh, just to underscore what the governor said, there is plenty of hospital bed, uh, intensive care unit, and ventilator capacity in the state of Nebraska. There is no doubt about it. We all track this literally on a daily basis, as the governor knows. Yes, I do. Uh, but, uh, uh, we, and we look at it, again, not just statewide and, and not just into the local health care collaborative districts. We look at it every single county and every single public health district every single day and give them the data that they're probably well aware of. Uh, I can't, as I sit here, I can't tell you we will not reach the time that in one public health district or in one hospital system uh, that'll be the case. But right now there is plenty of capacity across the state. And, it, you know, to the questioner's uh, point, it is up. There's no question uh, that it's up. But we're going to see that. I mean, when, particularly as we get into flu season, and by the way, everybody ought to get their flu vaccine. I don't get a chance to say that again, but uh, please do. But as we get into uh, the fall season, it starts to get a little colder. People are concentrating more indoors. Uh, you know, we've got to be extra vigilant about it, and I think we are going to see an uptick, and we're just going to have to be responsible for it and monitor the data carefully and make real-time decisions. And I know, you know, we, we talk a lot, and, uh, and we are making real-time decisions. 
Governor Ricketts, Maggie from Lincoln uh, calls in and says, what is your plan to help small business owners during this pandemic and economic crisis? Little has been done so far. Everyone is still hurting immensely. Yeah, and especially if you look at some, some of the specific industries around, say, hospitality or bars and restaurants, we know that there are particular industries that have been more impacted than others. And this is part of what we did with our $330 million that we set aside directly for small businesses and livestock producers, where we had that $12,000 grant. So we're working our way through that program. And then, of course, uh, we want to continue to look at what our options are for other industries that might need more attention. And so we're working on some additional plans for that. But we understand that the small business community is, is hurting. And, uh, we, we know that we've uh, you know, got to keep an eye on some of those specific industries that I just mentioned, and so we're working on some plans for that. Not ready to mention anything, any specifics right now because we're still working through those plans, but we're, we're aware and we're continuing to look at what we might be able to do. Uh, also, what about uh, the virus affecting staffing and corrections? Uh, an inmate who tested positive for COVID-19 has died. What's the situation like in the larger facilities? And are you considering any changing to testing protocols for prisons? So with regard to that, we offer uh, our inmates the same sort of facility to get tested as anybody else. So anybody in our correction system can get tested anytime they want. And actually one of the challenges we're running into is some of our inmates don't want to get tested. And we can't force them to get tested. So uh, with regard to our staffing, Director Frakes has had a plan in place for how to handle these types of emergencies. He had it you know, years before we even hit this pandemic. And so he's working that plan. Uh, we're gonna continue to make sure we're doing the best job we can. Sometimes it requires us to take steps that we know has an impact on the inmates. For example, not allowing family visits. We know that's something that is you know, a challenge for the families and for the inmates. And sometimes it's just like with the long-term care facilities is necessary because you've got that congregate living. Um, and we are constantly looking at if we have to tweak a plan a little bit, we will do it. And you know, I have regular conversations with D Director Frakes on how things are going. We just, you know, just like everybody else, we have to just continue to manage the virus to keep the inmates healthy as we can. Yvonne and Lincoln uh, says Nebraska is nearly surrounded by states in the red zone. What measures will you take to keep Nebraskans safe and why do you challenge mask mandates? So getting the doctor or Gold's point, we know masks work, right? So people should wear masks. It's one of the tools we have to be able to slow the spread of the virus. So if you're gonna be indoors with poor ventilation, closer than six feet, you ought to be wearing a mask. It's not the only tool we have. There's other tools we have like trying to keep that six foot of distance, washing your hands often and so forth. What I'm opposed to is the mandates. Um, I believe what we ought to be doing is educating people on what are the appropriate times that you should be wearing a mask and asking Nebraskans to do the right thing. And let me tell you, you know, early on in this pandemic, we didn't do a stay-at-home order either. We were one of seven states that didn't do a stay-at-home order. And yet we were able to manage our way through the pandemic because we asked Nebraskans to do the right thing and they did it. And so when you have mandates, you breed resistance. And that's part of what we're seeing now, I think, in, in some of the places that have the mask mandates. So what I think we want, need to continue to do is make sure we're educating people with regard to what the tools are. If you watch my press briefings, you'll see I start them all off and I end them all off talking about if you go to the store, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay six feet away. So we want to continue to, to hammer that home. And I think especially now it's important to kind of highlight that some of the spread we're seeing right now is in 40, 50, and 60-year-olds. So I know there was, there was kind of a perception at first that when the kids came back to the university, this was about kids going to bars, it's retirees going to have coffee, it's weddings. I mean, it's dances where that demographic of 40, 50, 60 year olds are going. So this is something we all have to be mindful of that if you know somebody, they can still give you coronavirus. This is not something where you're just gonna get it from a stranger. Uh, somebody you know could give you that virus and probably maybe even more likely to because you're going to be closer in contact with them. So we all have to be mindful of all these different situations. When's the right time to use a mask? If you walk into a crowded bar or restaurant, probably a good opportunity to pick a different bar or restaurant to go to because we know that if you're going to be inside in poor ventilation in crowded conditions, that's when the virus is most likely to spread. Dr. Gold, as we're winding down our time today, just I want to ask you a little bit about the financial health of hospitals. UNMC did a report that showed even before the pandemic started, hospitals were struggling at times. Do you think because of the uh, decrease in non-COVID patients in hospitals across the state that we could see some hospitals that are going to be in financial trouble? Well, certainly speaking on the national level, and I'm sure it applies to Nebraska as well, uh, we are seeing a lot of stress, particularly in the smaller hospital systems and the individual community 
and critical access hospitals of, of states. We're seeing uh, mergers and acquisitions that are occurring across the country. I think some of the CARES Act dollars have gone a long way to shoring up uh, some of the hospitals, but that's a temporary aberration uh, as they get back to, uh, you know, full normal or near normal capacity. And I can only speak for uh, Nebraska Medicine, which I know uh, quite well, and we're uh, well over 90 percent of the capacity uh, that we would have normally been for this time of year going into what would normally be the, uh, the flu season. But the losses have been dramatic. You know, there are, there are hospital systems across the country that lost over a billion dollars uh, in the first part of this year. And those are uh, unrecoverable losses, uh, you know, as far as those systems are concerned. Uh, the good side of it is we've learned a little different ways to practice medicine. You know, we're doing a lot more telehealth and, and people like it. Uh, we're smarter about scheduling visits and things along those lines. So there are going to be some good things that are going to be sustained, but I think it's going to change the practice of medicine, and it's certainly going to change our approach to infectious disease uh, going forward. Governor Ricketts, I asked a similar question to Commissioner Bloomstead earlier, but when you look at this pandemic, what are the things that you've learned, and we just have a, a minute or so, but what are the things that you've learned that you think you're going to take away and continue even after the pandemic is over? Well, I think one of the things, obviously, is we want to continue to take the lessons from this pandemic and be prepared for the next one. Uh, one of the things that did help us is that we did have a small stockpile <clears throat> of personal protective equipment uh, that was helpful in helping us get through kind of that early period. Probably what we're going to need to do is have a bigger stockpile going forward to be able to help manage that. I think one of the things that we had is we had some plans in place for how we were going to manage the state, and we put those in place, and I think they worked relatively well. And I think long term what we're going to be looking at is do we really need to have as many people in the real estate that we have? Are we going to be able to allow more remote working? And I think that's going to be true of other businesses as well. So people are going to be evaluating that kind of that trade-off. Um, not that people are going to want to always work from home 100 percent of the time. I think that they're going to want to come into the office, but maybe they can work from home more than they're working right now. And that will mean that we we'll maybe need less real estate but uh, and more flexible work schedules that ultimately maybe make us a more attractive employer down the road. So I think there are some things that we're going to learn from this and do differently. Um, you know, and in fact, that, that's not just us. I was talking to the folks at the, the state fair. There were things they learned through this pandemic because they had the state fair, but it was a little bit different. And they're like, well, some of this stuff was really good ideas. We just may do this next year. 30 seconds or less. Anything you specifically would do differently that you wish you hadn't have done? Well, I, I, I got to tell you, Dennis, I don't think about it that way. Look, if if I knew six months ago what I knew today, yeah, we do a lot of things different, but you don't. I mean, you can't go back in time and say, well, if I knew this. Uh, so I never really get caught up in thinking about it that way. I'm just like, hey, we made the best decisions we could with the information we had at the time. And then did we always get it right? No, but we do the best we can and then we move on. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll end on that. That is all the time we have tonight. Thank you for uh, being with us, and thanks to Governor Pete Ricketts for returning to the chair and, and answering our questions. Dr. Jeffrey Gold, as well, thank you from the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Commissioner Matt Bloomstead, uh, our Education Commissioner, thank you so much. Thanks also to the NET crew working behind the scenes to bring this program to you. You can watch tonight's program online at netnebraska.org slash coronavirus where you'll also find our news team's ongoing pandemic coverage. Part of that coverage includes telling the stories of Nebraskans who have died of coronavirus. NET is working with media outlets across the state to collect those stories. If you have lost someone to COVID-19, please go to netnebraska.org slash coronavirus and share a few details about your loved one. Our hope is to be able to share those stories of those people that we've lost during this pandemic. Coming up next week on Speaking of Nebraska, University of Nebraska President Ted Carter will be our guest for the entire program. Tune in next Thursday night at 8 Central on NET and on NET Radio. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks so much for watching.